Oops, I scrolled too far. All right, there was the first trig example. Now this next trig example, um, it, it feels like it goes right off the deep end, but I promise it's gonna really use the same principle that we looked at before. Let's step through this one at a time. It says, show that this derivative, or the derivative of this I should say, will give you sine cubed x, and hence find this thing, this integral, okay? Now why is the question phrased in this way? The whole point here is that you will encounter uh, functions that you don't know how to integrate off the face of it. You know, it's not something, it's not some standard form that you've memorized with some rule that you're like, oh, sine cubed x always turns into this, okay? So therefore, to help you out in integrating this, what they do is they say, if you work out this guy over here, that will help you. So let's try that out and then see how we can use that knowledge to finish out the whole question. How do I do this? Well, let's, let's start by differentiating. When they tell you to prove that something equals something else, if they want you to prove that, say, for example, uh, this is green, so let's go. If they want you to prove that A equals B, don't start off by saying A equals B and then do some stuff and then show that those things end up being you know, equal, like one equals one or something like that. That's not a way to prove something because you have started off assuming that the statement's true. You've written A equals B, right? So of course it's gonna work out, okay? I can actually make things that are incorrect, uh, like two equals one, I can just multiply both sides by zero and then you get a, uh, a right statement at the end, so that doesn't prove that two equals one, that's rubbish, okay? So instead what you need to do, not that, instead what you need to do is start with one side, like A, the left hand side, and then start doing some things on it, and then hopefully after doing enough things, you'll end at B. Or you could do it in the reverse order if you preferred and it was more convenient to you. In this case, I'm gonna start on the left because I've got a thing to differentiate, I know how to differentiate, let's go for it, okay? The thing I'm differentiating is, Slightly monstrous, it's a third cos cubed x, and I'm gonna take this opportunity to write that as cos x all cubed minus cos x. Hmm, how do I deal with this? All right, well, firstly, let's, let's take each term um, in turn. So there's a, a first term in here, and then there's a second one, let's choose a more contrasty color, in here. So we'll deal with the red part first, okay? For starters, there's just a third as a constant coefficient hanging out the front there. So I'm just gonna leave that there. And then what I get is this cos x cubed. So this is the function of a function. I need to use the chain rule here, right? So I'm gonna do the, uh, I'll do the inside, then I'll do the outside. The inside function is cos x. What is the derivative of cos x? It's negative sine x. There's the inside, done. Got the outside, which is cos x all cubed. So when something's cubed, and I'm doing that, I'm gonna bring the index out the front, and then I'm gonna divide by that new index. So I'm gonna get three cos x squared. Okay, so now I've done the inside, I've done the outside, the red thing is done. Let's have a look at the, uh, the blue one. I've got a, a minus sign that was uh, just carried over from the original expression, and then cos x. What's the derivative? of cos x, well, we just did it, didn't we? It's negative sine x, so I'm gonna put in negative sine x, okay. At this point, I need to do a bunch of simplification, so let's see what we can tidy up here. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll keep my red and my blue just for now. I can see there's going to be this um, one third and this three, they're gonna cancel with each other, so I just get one. And then lastly, I have this minus sign, right? So that is the only thing that gets left out the front a minus sign, it's really a minus one, right? Then I've got uh, sine x, and then cos x all squared, as we saw before, um, a shorthand way of writing that is cos squared x. So there you go, there's the, uh, there's the red derivative. Now this blue derivative, wrong color, I've got two negatives, so it just ends up being canceled out, and you get plus sine x, okay? Now at this point, a lot of you will look at this and scratch your head, you'll be like, mm, well now what? Like I mean, I've, I've done the differentiation, I've, I've tidied it up, it looks simpler than what I started with, that's true, but I haven't proven what I was asked to do at the beginning, right? You can see this is where I was end, meant to end up, right? This was meant to be my B, my end point, okay? So whenever you're proving things like this, you keep one eye on the working and a second eye on your destination so you know which way to head. When I realize I'm heading to something like sine cubed x, the thing that stands out to me is there are no cosine terms in here, right? There are no causes, it's just sines. So what that says to me is 
this cause in here, like, oh, I gotta get rid of it somehow, right? It shouldn't, it doesn't belong, it shouldn't be there, okay? So I'll color in different things so you don't confuse it with the green in the previous line. How do I get rid of cosines and replace them with sines? Well, there's a bunch of ways to do this, but if you think back, the most helpful way is something we learned last year called the Pythagorean identity. This comes from using um, trigonometry in the unit circle and using Pythagoras, hence Pythagorean the uh, theorem, uh, identity I should say. This is what the Pythagorean identity tells us. Sine squared plus cos squared equals one. So how do I use this to get rid of cos squareds and replace them with sines? Um, well what I'm going to do here is I'm going to rearrange this equation here in orange and I'm going to make cos squared the subject. To do that, I am going to subtract sine squared from both sides. So I get one minus sine squared on the right hand side. Okay? Now I hope you can see, you can take this term here on the left um, and notice that it's the same as the cos squared x in my actual line. So I can substitute in the right hand side since these two things are equivalent, right? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna write the minus out the front, sine x, and I'm going to write 1 minus sine squared as my substitution. So here is the use of the Pythagorean identity. Now, it looks like things are getting messier, not simpler, but you have to have a little faith, right? Once I take this guy and I actually expand these brackets, you're going to see everything will come out in the wash. Uh, I've got a minus sine x, <clears throat> excuse me, out the front. And then I've got a, watch for it carefully, uh, let's choose this, I've got a minus sine x multiplied by a minus sine squared x. So number one, the negatives cancel, leaving me with a plus, and then uh, the sine x times sine squared x is sine cubed x, which is exactly what we were hoping for. When you have that plus sine x along the end, you can see that these two guys here and here are going to cancel, which leaves us with the sine cubed x that we were looking for. So I'm gonna conclude by saying uh, sine cubed x as required. All right, now what have we done? What have we established? Well, we have shown, like the question asked, that that derivative on the left-hand side leaves you with sine cubed x. How does this help us? Well, the question itself asks us to find the integral of sine cubed x from naught to pi on three. So this sine cubed x is the thing I have on the right hand side. All I need to do to find out the answer to this is to integrate with respect to x from naught to pi on three. So I'm gonna take this right hand side and I'm going to integrate it from naught to pi on three with respect to x. Now over and over again, we've been seeing, if you do something to one side of the equation, you've got to do it to the other. So I'm going to get the integral, not just of the right hand side, but the integral of the left. Now, if you differentiate something and then you integrate it, then you're just going to end up back where you started, plus a constant if you have an indefinite integral. But I don't have an indefinite integral, I have a definite integral, right? So therefore, when I integrate this, I'm going to end up exactly where I started, cos x all cubed minus cos x, so long as I am actually doing a definite integral from naught to pi on three. You can see I've just taken the same boundaries from the right hand side and I've got them there on the left hand side. So that's the hardest part of this. Now I'm ready to actually just evaluate the thing. Uh, let me move this guy over to the left because that's where we normally put the subject of the equation. I'll move it down a little bit just so I've got a little more space. And now let's just complete the substitution um, by evaluating each of the boundaries. Uh, I've got a big set of brackets here. Um, what have I got here? So a third of cos pi on three, which is cubed minus cos of pi on three. There's the upper boundary. And then I'm gonna subtract the lower boundary. So it's a third of cos zero cubed minus cos zero. Whew, all right, uh, I'm gonna need my exact values here again. So what do I got? I've got a third times, this is cos of pi on three. So in degrees, this is cos of 60 degrees. That's a half, but remember the half has been cubed. See that, you've got a half times a half times a half. So that's gonna be one over eight. And then I'm gonna subtract uh, just a half because that's cos pi on three. 
There's the upper boundary. Let's do it for the bottom boundary. Um, I've got a third times cos zero cubed. Now cos zero we saw before is just one. So one cubed is also one. So now I'm just gonna subtract. Okay, I'm getting there. What have I got now? I've got um, one over 24. Since that's in 24th, so I might as well put this in 24th. So there's 12 of those. And then I've got, let's see here in the end, um, a third take away one is negative two thirds, but I might as well write that in 24ths. Negative two thirds will be negative 16 over 24. Just do a mental check on there. Yeah, divide the top and bottom by eight, you'll get negative two thirds. All right, everything's in 24ths, so let's start simplifying out. I've got negative 11 24ths there, Double negative cancels plus 16. So I'm getting, by the looks of things, five over 24. So that seems like a lot of work to get such a simple answer. Um, but that's one of the geniuses of all of the knowledge that we've developed in uh, calculus so far and in trigonometry. You can see I had to use some trigonometric identities that maybe are not familiar with you for, with you for a while. Um, I had to simplify a lot of algebra here. Um, and then I had to use some exact values like we saw earlier.